I have seen some of the most crazy things God do. Like the, the, the things that my mind can't fathom. And I don't really, under, I don't know where some of you guys are at with, with healing, but um, I know there's a, some disagreements on it. But I want you to just think, if these testimonies are actually real, pretty wild. If God is who he says he is, then he probably comes on the scene and does some wild things. And so we're going to have some people come forward and testify about what Jesus did this summer. These testimonies will stir your faith. So I'm going to have some people come forward and they're going to share testimonies. Just tune in. Let's go. Come on. Okay, so this testimony is from uh, Toronto. And we were in Dundas Square, which is like the Toronto equivalent of Times Square. And there was a Muslim man in an electronic wheelchair who skirted by me. And I was able to talk to him and I said, sir, do you want to walk again? And he said, man, I can't walk. And I said, no, I know a God that, that can, he can make you get up and walk right now. And so I laid my hands on this man, um, this Muslim man who doesn't know Jesus. And I asked a simple prayer for him to get up and walk. And this man gets up and he walks. He walks. And for the first time in 17 years, a man walked. And he sent me a picture like three weeks ago of him just like chilling, standing. So that means he had to get up and walk again for that to happen, just so you guys know. Another testimony, it's from, um, we were in Maine, and there was a man, um, he had uh, broken his collarbone two weeks prior to when I was able to talk to him. And collarbones don't heal in two weeks, just so, you guys, just so you guys know. And I was able to pray for this guy and just call upon the name of Jesus. And he, and he lifts his, he went from no mobility and he gets to hear. He gets halfway and he just starts to break down crying because God touched him and he knew he was completely healed. And he is able to go back in to, his, to the church and he holds his sling and he says, Pastor, look, I'm healed. Next testimony, we were in New Jersey. Me and some of my teammates decided to go out and do some bar evangelism. And one of the first girls I saw in the bar, my heart was just gripped for her. And I immediately felt that she was unsatisfied as most people are who are in bars. But I went up to her and I was like, girl, are you unsatisfied? She looks me dead in the eye. She's like, yeah. And as I'm talking to her, she tells me that her name is Cassie. And I begin to remember that before I left for tour this summer, I had a dream about meeting a woman named Cassie who would give her life to Jesus. And as I'm remembering this, I look at her and I'm like, no way, are you serious? And I tell her about this dream. And in my dream, she was spiritually blinded to the reality of who Jesus is. And I'm explaining this to her and I say, have you ever heard of the gospel? She tells me no. I share the gospel with her. She's getting so encountered by the love of Jesus. She surrenders her entire life to Jesus, puts down her drink and walks out of the bar. This testimony is from Oslo, Norway, and we were playing basketball on our rest day, and five kids about the age of 13 all come up to us. Um, turns out they're all Muslim and actually in a foster care system for refugees. So they're playing basketball with us, and praise God, we had a friend that spoke Norwegian. He translates the gospel to them. And one of the kids had a broken wrist. He had just broke his wrist a few days before. Um, we pray for his healing, and his, his wrist literally gets healed in an instant. He starts wiggling his fingers he says, I think I can do a push-up now. Can I try? Can I do a push-up now? And so his wrist got fully healed. He then gives his life to Jesus. And the other four, or the other three didn't, but then there's this girl that Kylie had pulled away and shared the gospel with. And she said that she was in her room and she saw us playing basketball. And she said something in her spirit jumped and said, I need to go. I need to go over there. There's something over there for me. And she had just been contemplating why she's alive. Um, she came over. We start sharing, the, Kylie shares the gospel with her. She gives her life to Jesus. She gets a Bible. She ends up giving Kylie a crystal that she used to hold on to for hope, going from foster care home to foster care home. In translation, she got a Bible instead of exchange. So two people gave their life to Jesus. They were months, once Muslim, one got healed. Come, Come on. on. My team and I, we were in Vegas. Um, it was for the last week of tour. And after a really long night of evangelism uh, on Fremont Street, we have the great idea of debriefing the night at the parking lot where we, we had parked like, our cars. And so there's like 20 kids in this parking lot just sharing, talking about Jesus, thanking the Lord for what he did that night. And as we're sharing, this man, he stops. 
he stops to look at to look at what's going on and after like 10 to 15 minutes i approach him and i i go hey bro what's up what led you to stop by and he goes man it's just it's just weird seeing 20 kids in the middle of a parking lot just <laughs> chatting around and i start asking him more questions and, I, and eventually i tell them that we love jesus that is that that is why we're in vegas and he starts sharing with me that he's mad at god that god killed his mom when he was younger that God killed his dad from a drug addiction. That he has always, throughout his entire life, refused to believe in God. And he also shares with me that in that moment, he was on his way to commit suicide. He was on his way to take his own life because he could find no more hope. He didn't find a purpose. And all of a sudden, for 10 to 15 minutes, we're going back and forth in these conversations. He's asking me questions. He's asking me questions about God. Why, if I read the Bible, if I prayed, if I tried talking to him, why did my why is my mom gone? Why, if I tried to approach him, why did he never meet? He never met me in that place. He starts sharing with me how he has never felt his presence. He has never heard his voice. And I remember my team. They start to wrap up. They start to get in the vans. And for those of you that know me, I'm not a very serious person. <laughs> but, but in that moment. The Holy Spirit just came in that moment and he started speaking to him through me. I said, Franco, would you look at me in the eyes right now? God gave me a picture of him putting a gun to his head the night before. And so I asked him, I said, Franco, did you put a gun to your head the night before? And he said, yes. As he starts to cry, I start sharing the love in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I remember what I said in that moment. The Holy Spirit just started revealing things to him as he's weeping. All I remember saying at the end is saying, Franco, if you don't want your life anymore, it's time for you to give it to someone who wants it. And his name is Jesus. And by the end of that conversation, he's weeping with his arms open. And he asked me a question, how do I do that? We walk through prayer. He gives his life to Jesus. And in that moment, the Lord prompts me to grab his head, put it on my shoulder. And so I asked him if I can give him a hug, and I give him a hug, and I put his head on my shoulder. And as soon as I do, all I heard God say was, tell him I love him. And I said, Franco, God loves you. And he starts weeping on my shoulder saying, I feel it, I feel it, I feel his love. I remember grabbing Franco's head off of my shoulders, looking at him in the eyes, and he was a different person. Since then, I've been in contact with him, and he's been completely free from drugs threw away the gun he was gonna use to take his own life. And it's walking in freedom. And guys, like I said, this is just one of many stories. And I actually wanna share some numbers with you guys from this summer. And the reason we wanna share these numbers is because they're actually important. Each and every single one of these people's names are written in the book of life. And so are you guys ready to hear some numbers? Come on, this summer, there was six teams all across the U.S., Norway, and Alaska. We saw a total of 1,542 people commit their lives to Jesus. These moments when we encountered people, when I encountered Franco, and I was listening to all the brokenness, the confusion, all these moments, all these 1,500 people, in those moments we were listening to them, looking at them in the eyes. It could have been really easy to give them a five-step program, it could have been really easy to give him a self-help book. It could have even been easier to give them our own advice. But there is one thing that separates the gospel from everything else. And it's that it carries a substance. And it is the power to save. It is the power to bring souls from death to life. And you might be wondering how, how do, I, how do I receive this power? How do I understand it? It is through faith in Jesus Christ. It is through faith that God created us for a purpose. That purpose was to know him. But like a gentleman, he gave us a choice. Would you enter into that relationship with me or not? And we chose not to. We chose separation from him. But guys, he was in so much love in all who he is. The Bible says that he loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son to live a perfect life. 
to carry a cross up a mountain, be put on that cross with nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head. He paid the price that me and you were supposed to take. But that's not the end of the story. He resurrected three days later, defeating death, sin, and the grave, and anything that could separate us from his love. It is faith that God created us to know him. It is faith that Jesus died, resurrected, and because of him, now we have right standing with God. And guys, it would be a mess if I share this, but I don't share that there's a cost to following Jesus. And it is actually everything. There's no such a thing as Jesus and relationship with him. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And guys, some people, some people might refer to this as a sacrifice. To give your old life so that you could access the new life that he has to give. Some people refer to it as a sacrifice. But is it really a sacrifice? Was it really a sacrifice to, for Franco that night to trade death for life? Was it really a sacrifice for Franco that night to trade depression for, for joy? Was it really a sacrifice for Franco that night to trade anxiety for peace? I don't think so. And guys, God, he doesn't just offer a quick fix. He doesn't just put a band-aid on the wound. He gives a full life. He gives a new life. And I actually believe there's an invitation for some of us here tonight. And there's not an age gap. This is not for the spiritual leaders in, this, in here. This is not just for the young people. This is not just for the kids. This is for each and every single one of you. And so I'm going to actually ask you to do something really bold right now. If as I'm speaking, you feel like that's you, the number one, you have never accepted Jesus in your heart as your Lord and Savior. And you're ready to make that decision tonight. Or number two, you have before but you feel like you've fallen away from that relationship. I wanna tell you something, he wants everything. And so if you fall under, the, under those two categories, I'm actually gonna ask you to raise your hand at the count of three.